dance festivals to the sea sculptures they did on the beach. They did so many things. From the bathing bells of the 1930s, water. I go to every concert that was at Cleethorpe's Winter Gardens from being 12. Well, there's a lot of teenagers and adults in the town now who you remember. This was the reason that Cleethorpe's was really put on the map. Endless names had played this venue. It was so iconic. I just could not believe the amount of people that were standing there in front of me. The popular seaside resort continues to reinvent its entertainment. It's just such a magic place. I mean, it's just so... <laughs> Welcome to the Heritage Channel on Clee TV, where we explore the fascinating history of North East Lincolnshire in our monthly roundup of news, views and other stories. If you're watching on YouTube, click the subscribe button below, or on Facebook, join the group to make sure you don't miss any of our programmes. <laughs> on the Heritage Channel tonight, do you remember Nights Out at Cleethorpe's Pier or the Empire Theatre? What do Buffalo Bill and a prominent Lincolnshire family have in common? <laughs> have you joined the Heritage Network, bringing together people and organisations who are passionate about local history? Here's Gail Graham from Heritage Lincolnshire to tell us more about the first meeting. The group met via Zoom on the 21st of April. We had just under 40 participants who joined us and we set um, everybody some homework because we wanted their feedback to help shape the meeting. And what we looked at was we asked people to define what they considered the word heritage meant to them and we had some really strong feedback about it being people, the places and past, which I thought was really lovely. And then we asked them to identify three heritage um, assets or things or places from Northeast Lincolnshire that they considered were really sort of important to the region. And as you would imagine, we got some um, very well-known um, heritage like the docks, uh, the piers, um, Victorian seaside heritage, um, and then some lots of lovely, less well-known ideas. And that sparked all sorts of conversations um, about reminiscence and oral history to do with music in the 60s and 70s and um, ghosts in the area and UFO sightings, which was very interesting, I know. Um, and then the final part of the meeting, we asked people what they wanted to get from the network. And there were three very clear things that came through. They wanted to um, champion and celebrate North East Lincolnshire's heritage because there's so much that people don't know about that they wanted to sort of say, look, it's here, it's amazing. Um, they wanted to share information, best practice, projects and ideas that they were having. Um, so they wanted to use the network as a central place to go to, to find out information. And then what was really exciting, they wanted to use the network to develop projects, partnerships and collaboration to really, again, put the Northeast Lincolnshire's um, heritage in the spotlight and in focus. Since its opening in 1893, Cleethorpe's Pier has been just one of the many iconic venues that have created happy memories and legendary tales that are now part of community folklore. Many of the iconic Cleethorpe's venues that provided entertainment for both locals and visitors have now gone. Others have been repurposed to serve the community in new ways. Built in 1873 with money from the Sheffield, Manchester and Lincolnshire Railway Company, Cleethorpe's Pier gave the influx of holidaymakers from Northern Textile and Steel Mills the chance to follow the ebbing tide on a 1,200-foot journey out across the sand. The addition of a pavilion in 1888 hosted dancers, concerts and other entertainment. When the original pavilion was destroyed by fire in 1903, a new one replaced it nearer the shoreline. It included shops and cafeteria. Substantial refurbishment in 1968 added a 600-seat concert hall, cafe and bar, which hosted traditional summer shows, wrestling, live music, dance festivals and even coin and stamp fairs. The venue hosted some of the best music and top entertainers of the period. 
1985, the pavilion was converted into a nightclub, Pier 39, which became a popular party venue featuring top DJs and live bands. Streets like a jungle the new century saw a turbulent period for the pier with several changes in ownership and purpose, but it continued to be a centre for entertainment and community events, including the legendary Millennium Celebration Party on the Pier, hosted by Viking FM Radio. It was, the, I think they used the pier itself as the stage and the audience were on the beach. The only problem was the tide came in. Uh, <laughs> the pier finally closed as an entertainment venue in 2015 but its latest reincarnation still provides another popular seaside attraction. The nearby Empire Theatre first opened in 1913, following conversion of the 19th century Alexander Hall. The theatre provided year-round entertainment from visiting repertory companies, talent contests, popular summer shows and winter pantomimes. During its heyday in the late 1940s and 50s, it attracted some of the country's greatest comedians, singers and entertainers. As television became more popular and the summer season shorter, audiences began to dwindle and the final curtain fell in 1960. First becoming a bingo hall, it is now, like the pier, another popular seaside attraction. The Marineland Zoo opened in 1966 on a site to the south of the resort. It boasted a wide range of aquatic and land-based animals, including lions, elephants, bears, penguins, dolphins, and even a killer whale called Calypso. People come back time and time again to Pleasure Island. Is it the fantastic family fun and entertainment? Is it the unbeatable value of the biggest day out on the East Coast? Or is it... The breathtaking boomerang? When the zoo closed in 1977, the site was redeveloped into a family theme park, which opened in 1993. Visit once and you'll come back! Pleasure Island's six different zones, each with its own themed landscape, rides and shows, proved popular with both visitors and locals alike. It was originally going to be Pleasurewood Hills in Cleethorpes, and it was going to be a Wild West theme in American, but um, their, the company that was doing that went bust, so they had to move on. Flamingo Land um, and Robert Gibb bought the park out completely. They brought in a new theming company, they redid all the buildings, uh, and they brought in the Spain theme, the Old England theme, and rides like the Boomerang and the bigger things, all of that was put in by them. It's a very long history. For such a small place, it's such a very intricate and amazing history to have researched. In the new century, it hosted family spectaculars like Planet Circus and music festivals featuring some of the top artists in blues, jazz and folk. Yeah, we did Cleesorts Rocks. Um, we moved it around a bit um, that we did it in Pleasure Island. So <clears throat> Pleasure Island theme park, we used the, uh, the giant food hall there. And we had the Proclaimers on one year, that was tremendous. And we could do two stages because they had a McCormax, which is a, a restaurant bar at the front of Pleasure Island and the large food hall at the back. So we were able to utilize that. And that was the birth of the um, the Cleethorpes Blues Festival. The park changed hands in 2010 and the new owner, Melanie Wood, added a farm and petting zoo in 2013. But with dwindling visitor numbers, the park struggled to survive, finally closing for good in 2016.
Now the ghosts of theme parks past haunt this eerie derelict site as nature begins to reclaim the land. You know, it, as part of the local history, I understand some people don't see it as that really that influential. I think Pleasure Island was the reason that Cleethorpes was really put on the map. In 2020, plans were unveiled by a private consortium to develop the site into a holiday village with hotel lodges and shops. The £57 million project will create 350 jobs and this once abandoned site will once again attract visitors to this popular seaside resort. Did you spot your younger self or someone you knew or knew and have perhaps lost touch with? Comment on our Facebook page, TV channel or email heritage at clee.tv. There is still time to join the new Heritage Network and the next meeting will start to explore some of the ideas and how they can be funded. The next meeting is on the 19th of May, so people are welcome to get in touch with us at Heritage Lincolnshire if they'd like to join that meeting. It, it will be by Zoom again, but we're hopeful that the meeting in July might be in person. Um, and what we're, we're doing then is we're going to be examining in a little bit more detail what the lottery considers their definitions of heritage are. We're very keen to welcome um, individuals as well as groups to the network. It is for everybody and anybody that's interested in the heritage of North East Lincolnshire. So um, please do get in touch. Thank you, Gail. Yes, people have been telling us about some great ideas. Here are just a few of them. The fascinating culture, architecture and ecology of the Humberston Fitties a photographic exhibition that charts the history of the Grimsby fish docks, stories of our famous sons and daughters, including director Peter Collinson, actor John Hurt and superstar songwriter Rod Temperton, a virtual tour of the Empire Theatre, a history of tattoos from the elaborate Spanish galleons that were a favourite of local fishermen to the loving declarations of holiday romances and the significance of Lincolnshire in the history of English folk music and its influence on classical composers. Nature, it is not agree, and she wept and she sighed, and so bitterly she cried. Age UK North East Lincolnshire is an independent charity providing a wide range of services and activities for people over 50. The pop-in centres in Grimsby and Cleethorpes are open daily, providing good value meals and a chance to meet old friends, make new ones and access a wide range of services, advice and support. The weekly lunch clubs are a particular favourite, especially with isolated or disabled people who are collected from home in a specially equipped minibus, thanks to a recent donation. Donations are just one of the many sources of income needed to provide these valuable services. The two charity shops and their volunteer workers also play an important role in fundraising. Coping with Change is a new initiative funded by the National Lottery, providing support during difficult times. During the COVID-19 crisis, Age UK North East Lincolnshire have been able to continue their essential services and provide additional emergency help, thanks to support from the National Lottery, Tesco's, Morrison's, Charities Aid Foundation, Humberston Lions, Cleethorpes Rotary, Neighbourly Funds and North East Lincolnshire District Council. If you would like to make a donation or volunteer your time and skills to support this vital facility, contact Helen Goodman on 01472 344 976 or go to ageuk.org.uk forward slash North East Links. <laughs> so what does heritage mean to you? Have you any ideas for heritage projects or stories to tell? Get in touch with heritage at clee.tv. One legendary story from the East Marsh Ward tells of how American hero Buffalo Bill rode to the rescue of the local community when a sudden gust of wind threatened the opening of their newly established park.
A prominent Lincolnshire family, a golden key, and even Buffalo Bill all play their part in the fascinating history of Grant Thorough Park in Grimston. There's two families in the area, one called Grant and one called Thorold. Alexander William Grant, born in 1820, he took a decree to have his name changed to Alexander William Grant Thorold. All his children took the name Grant Thorold. This family gave a hell of a lot back to this community. They donated the land that we stood on. And to be honest, it's fantastic what they've done to this area is, as far as I'm concerned. The official opening in 1904 with a golden key was a grand occasion which witnessed the thrilling rescue by Buffalo Bill and his Wild West show. 30th of June 1904, the Grimsby Telegraph described it as a red letter day, they did. And to be honest it was a red letter day because we would now got this brilliant open space. In the morning there were sort of various events and they had a great big marquee and there was glitchy crowds of people in this park. It was a brilliant day but the marquee blew over in the wind. And close by at Five Ways was Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show. And they heard about this, they come over and very quickly got the show back on the road. Three o'clock when the park officially opened by Harry Grant Fold, there was a speech by Mr Doughty, the MP for the area, and he talked about the, how the park would create well-being for people, and it was interrupted by <laughs> of the guns from the Wild West show, it was interrupted. A really formal and great occasion just had its hilarities throughout the day. Rhododendrons decorated the broad tree-lined paths. A bandstand and a bowling green provided entertainment and gentle exercise. In the 1940s, the grand gates and railings were cut down to help the war effort, and local residents sought safety in an air raid shelter on the southwest corner. The iconic bandstand was lost to the needs of a younger generation as the children's playground expanded with bigger and better rides. It's sad really, I would love to see that back. I would love to see help and assistance to get that bandstand back because wouldn't it be fantastic on a Sunday afternoon having youngsters dancing in there or bands playing as such. So I would really, really love to see that come back. The park holds many happy memories for local residents who played as children in its green spaces and grazed their knees on the swings and slides. The swings, the witch's hat, the flowers, always flowers, the flower beds over there. Over that side was a tennis court. Where we actually stood now was a bowling green. The keep off the grass signs, you know, you were never allowed on the grass. And you had a park keeper then. And if you stepped over there, he was out chasing you. There was no mess, there was no litter, it was, it was really pristine. When they went up the high slide, they put grease on it, so they went down quicker. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? The things that, that kids do. It was a fantastic place to come as a kid. Like, And we didn't have a lot of money. We just came out in, in these beautiful parks and played with our friends. Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful childhood times. The recent addition of a new library, cafe and community centre has encouraged more families into the park. The old library was down there. That uh, library was demolished and this new, new library, this new facility here, was built in 2010. It's like a community centre it is. It's a cafe when we're not in lockdown. It's a library when we're not in lockdown and they've also got the forest school in there they have, which is absolutely brilliant, it is for nature. A recent project led by ward councillors Steve Besant and Kay Rudd is returning the park to its former glory, recreating the original Victorian plantings and reflecting its fascinating history. 
We received a grant of £15,000 from government. We had a plan that we wanted to make it a nice place for people to sit in. And we've been able to create things back as they used to be. The totem poles might not have been here, but they're associated with Buffalo Bill. And our aim is to turn the clock back to 1904. They are looking to uh, recreate the Victorian planting that was originally done here which included uh, mixed shrubbery, they've got uh, monkey puzzle trees, rhododendrons, and they filled this place with wildflowers and shrubs and trees, and it's just fantastic, and it's, been, it's paying off. The amount of birds that have increased in this area. I got so excited about 10 minutes back. For the first time, I've seen three blue tits together in this park on the bird stands which we've created, and that is turning the clock back bringing the nature on. These bears are more or less protecting nowadays they are, but we're supporting them. As part of the Green Grow Box project, Steve's team are even growing vegetables for local residents to enjoy. It's just fantastic. Every time you come here, there's something else that they've improved upon or enhanced it. What Mr Doughty spoke about in 1904. He spoke about parks improving people's well-being. We're trying to improve people's well-being. And it's important that we keep these spaces. Thanks to the work of local ward councillors and their team of volunteers, Grant Thorrell Park is once again a thriving and pleasant space in the heart of the local community. Reflecting the vision of the benevolent Lincolnshire family who founded it over a century earlier. Is cultural heritage just part of history or is it a living, evolving thing shaped by our everyday lives? School children and young people in North East Lincolnshire have been creating stories, poetry, art and even songs reflecting their life in lockdown for a cultural competition. The scheme was the brainchild of Youth Action North East Lincolnshire in partnership with Hammond House, who will be publishing an anthology of winning entries bringing the culture of the young people of Grimsby to a worldwide audience and adding to the cultural heritage of their families, schools and communities for generations to come. <laughs> Creating cultural heritage has also been the mission of notable Grimbarian Charlotte Bowen through her community organisation The Culture House. One of her recent projects, Made in Grimsby, showcases the work in supporting the development of talented people, including singer-songwriter Amy Naylor. My name is Amy Naylor. I have grown up surrounded by music. I grew up in Grimsby. I've played music all my life and this is kind of what I do as a job now. I've done a lot of performing live around in the local area as well as around the UK, around uh, Europe and Canada and America and all that kind of thing. And now I teach as well. <laughs> Music has a lot of influences. A lot of my kind of songwritery type stuff comes from a lot of politics and local politics and global politics, kind of social relationships and that kind of thing. And a lot of my actual kind of musical influences come from my parents growing up around them um, and playing in bands with them and listening to their music. We got involved in the local acoustic scene and, and the folk scene and and just the heritage and we've been involved in commission to write stuff on fishing and, and on have a lot of the day in the founder of the town and things like that. We all exist within a context and my context is growing up in Grimsby and, and the heritage in Grimsby and again I'm very much inspired by yeah stories and we've got so many stories here in Grimsby we've got you know all the fishing heritage and all that kind of stuff. I 
know she's been influenced by local stories and local heritage. Um, and she's worked with Rebecca Maskell, who uh, we sort of partnered up with a good few years ago. And I believe that they carried on a bit of a creative relationship. I've been to a lot of Culture House events, both as uh, just to attend, both to perform and play in different contexts. She's been hosted um, here in People's Park as part of our live events programme. By working in the event, that gave me a real insider's look and to see lots of other musicians as well, both local and musicians that have been brought in through, um, through Culture House has been a huge inspiration and something to aspire to, especially as a teenager when I was doing it. And the Culture House has given her so many opportunities to be seen and get yeah. out there and grow in confidence. We've seen her grow in confidence. Yeah. Organisations like the Culture House are so important, not just for bringing arts in um, and for giving artists like me an opportunity to create and connect and share, but to, to provide a space where community can come together. I think she's really made a lot of being in Grimsby and developed what she does. And I think she's a real asset to the area. And I'm inspired by how we as a town have grown and kind of overcome a lot of stuff. And we've gone from this rich heritage and we're now growing into a very artistic community, I think, at least in my little happy bubble. Um, and so that inspires me a lot as well. Like the clouds, I'll float in the sky. And I like to see a reflection of the beauty in your eyes, of the beauty in your eyes. <laughs> there will be a lot happening in Heritage in North East Lincolnshire over the coming months and years, but it's your stories we want to tell. You can message us on Facebook, email our news desk, heritage at clee.tv, or join the new Heritage Network. The next meeting is a Wednesday the 19th of May from 2 to 4 o'clock. It's meeting via Zoom. So if anybody would like to join us, if they email myself at gailgraham at heritagelincolnshire.org, we can add them onto the mailing list and send them out an invitation. Well, that's almost all for tonight's programme. If you're watching on Facebook, don't forget to join our group or on YouTube, click the subscribe button below. Thank you for watching. See you soon on the Heritage Channel. <laughs>